Well, a recently ordained priest, Father Henry, was to hold his first ever graveside burial service at the cemetery for a destitute man who didn't have any family or friends. Father Henry, not knowing where the cemetery was, made several wrong turns and he got lost. He eventually arrived an hour late. The hearse was nowhere in sight. The spade was next to the open hole and the workmen were under a tree eating their lunch. Father Henry wanted to be a reliable priest, so he went to the open grave and found that the vault had already been placed there. Feeling guilty about his lateness, he preached his greatest sermon, sending the deceased to the great beyond in style. As the father returned to his car, he overheard one of the workmen say to the other, you know, I've been putting septic tanks in for 25 years and never seen a blessing like that. It was much better than that, I'm telling you. You know, it's one church Sunday. We're all supposed to clap at a good joke. We're supposed to be excited to be here. Well, today I want to spend some time talking about never say never. I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in Buffalo, New York. How many of you knew that? How many of you didn't know that? I grew up in Buffalo, New York. You know, a great middle-class, hard-working community. You know, used to have a lot of steel mills and stuff, but we used to have this pastime in Buffalo, New York that we used to do all the time. We played football. How many love football growing up? Right, we used to play football all the time. I played Pop Warner, played in high school, played in the backyard. I love playing in the backyard. In fact, I'm thinking about having a turkey bowl this year, getting all the men together the Saturday after Thanksgiving and play a little football. How many men are in? There's five men, and I don't know what the rest of you guys are. But we used to play football, you know, Buffalo, New York, home of the four-time Super Bowl losers. <laughs> Buffalo Bills, record-setting, four in a row and couldn't win one. Not bitter about that at all. But we used to play football all the time. I had a friend, when we used to play in the backyard, I had a good friend of mine at the time that used to, he used to play wide receiver. His name was Tim, you're going to love his last name, Loudenschlager. And he used to play, and he was a wide receiver, and I usually played quarterback, and so he'd be over there. And I remember it was always a time he would do what nobody else could do. And so there was this one, and, and this was repeated over and over again. I'm a hike, I drop back, I set, I throw it as far as I could. The guy covering Tim stopped running and said, there's no way this guy's going to get that ball. And Tim had this hyper speed he went into. He went so fast. He tracked down that ball, pulled it in, scored a touchdown. Backyard, backyard football. He had this expression that he'd get up and he said after. Let me tell you something, never say never. You know, we started to believe that. Because he did it repeatedly over and over and over again. And, you know, a part of that statement resonated in my heart. And it became like kind of a mantra that I lived by. Never say never. You can never say never on yourself, and you should never say never on God. Do you believe that? I mean, there's no way you can ever or should ever count God out. Somehow he would always get to the ball. It's pretty remarkable. I want to encourage you today that no matter what you are going through, never say never with God. Can you say that loud and proud? Never say never. All right. Well, God, I, you know, there's times we'll make statements like, well, God will never restore my marriage. It, it, it's too far gone. It's too difficult. Or God will never heal my body. There's no way God could heal what's going on in my body. God will never repair my wounded spirit. And all too often, we make those negative declarations about a God who can do anything. And when we say God will never, what we're saying is, I don't believe God can. Church, hear me today. I still believe God could do anything. And if I have that core belief, I'm never going to say never to God or to one of his children. If God has placed something in your heart, never say never with God. If God is doing something in your spirit, never say never with God. Doesn't matter how dark it is or how bad it may seem. Never say never with God. You may be down, but you are not out. You can feel discouraged, but you can never be defeated. You may feel dry, but you are not dead because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Church Unleashed, never say never with God. Just can't do it. Scripture says this, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Anybody ever been tired? 
Sometimes doing the right thing routinely and you feel like I'm not getting the right results. He says, don't get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, you will reap a harvest of blessing if we do not give up. Church Unleashed here to say, here's what I believe. Your harvest of blessing is on the way. Some of you have been waiting a long time. Some of you have been struggling and going through it. Guess what? You've been doing the right thing, and the harvest of blessing is on its way. If you're not dead, God's not done with you. God still has something for you to accomplish. Never say, hey, can we take a minute and welcome our internet campus watching online? So good to have you guys with us today. Think about this. What if Noah said to God, I can never build that ark? There's no way I could do it. Truth is, none of us would be here today. We would all have been wiped out by the great flood. But Noah refused to say never. Job, he never said never. Even after minutes, he, in a moment of minutes, he lost his family. He lost his possessions. He lost his livelihood. And he lost his property. All gone. But he trusted God. He refused to say never on God. The Bible's promise was fulfilled at the end of his life where scripture says the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. Imagine if Job gave up. He would never have experienced the blessing of God. Church, never say never with God. uh, Joseph never said never. In slavery, sold into slavery by his brothers, he never said never. In prison, He never said never. As a servant, he wouldn't allow those words or thoughts to come into his heart. He trusted that God had a plan for his life. Toward the end of his life, he was placed as second in command under Pharaoh. How about Saul of Tarsus? No one would ever imagine that this person who was hunting down and killing Christians would turn into the person who would write two-thirds of the New Testament and plant over 20 churches. There were a lot of people who said never about Saul, but Saul didn't say never about himself or the God he surrendered to on the road to Damascus. Saul became Paul. Never say never with God. I want to ask you a question today. Where have you been declaring never? Where have you been saying it'll never happen. I will never get that job. God will never send me a spouse. I could never start that business. God would never use me like he uses Curtis. Stop saying never. Start trusting a God that is with you, that loves you, and that is for you. Scripture declares this. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you ever do for the Lord is... Nothing you ever do for God is useless. The work at home is not useless. The work in your marriage is not useless. The work in your church is not useless. You ought to work with entheos. That's the original Greek word for enthusiasm. Entheos, it means in God. God is bubbling over in me. Whoa, come on now. When you're serving God, something's got to come out of you. Something's got to move you. Something's got to be celebrated. That You you said, man, God, you're doing something incredible in me. Stop talking yourself out of victory. See, when you're serving God, there's an enthusiasm in you that says, man, God can do anything. I believe that, and I'm living like he will. Grab this today. This is important. Your profession often becomes your possession. What you talk about, your words can determine the trajectory of your life. Did you know this? Most people speak at a rate of 150 to 200 words per minute. Now, if you're me, it might be like 300 words per minute. But you could speak at 150 to 200 words per minute. But do you know your mind can process 1,300 words a minute? Think about that. So there's sometimes that we speak before we think. In other words, we're speaking without allowing it to process. So when you hear the scripture, and the scripture says you can do all things through Christ, let it process before you declare it. In other words, get it in your mind. Say, you know what, I'm going to meditate on that. 
I'm going to focus on that. And then guess what? Now it doesn't become just words you speak. It becomes a belief you embrace. See, your profession often becomes your possession. The problem is we spend so much time talking ourselves down, beating ourselves up. Anybody have a bad past? Probably none worse than either one of our presidential candidates, but maybe you had a bad past. <laughs> maybe you had something you've gone through. Sorry, it's too soon. <laughs> something you've gone through, something you experienced. Anybody have anything you're not proud of that you've done before? Yeah, we all have that past. But I can't focus on the past. I can't even focus on the mistakes I made yesterday. They're already done. There's nothing I can do about them. I need to say, God, I'm sorry, and move on. Stop professing your yesterdays. Start professing your todays. I am a son and daughter of the Most High God. I am blessed. I have the favor of God. I am anointed by Him. Job said it this way. Though I am innocent, my own mouth would pronounce me guilty. Innocent, but yet in our own minds, we end up speaking these negative things about ourselves. Though I'm blameless, blameless, it would prove me to be wicked. See, a lot of times, it's our confession, it's our profession that determines our possession or where we're going. See, in other words, my words can be my worst enemy. Anybody ever had a negative thought? Not about that person you're sitting next to, of course. Anybody ever a negative thought about yourself? I think we all face those. We've got to watch the words. I've said this before, but just because it comes through my mind doesn't mean it has to flow through my mouth. I don't have to let it out. I don't have to speak it just because I think it. You can't go through life saying, I will never succeed. I will never get that education. I will never be blessed. I will never be valued. I will never find true love. I will never be more than just average. You can't go around saying, I will never be any of those things. Truth is, none of you are average. You are all above average. How do I know that? God handcrafted your life. You are a masterpiece created by a loving God. That means you've got great value. You are not average. You are not normal. Come on, look at somebody and tell them, I'm not average. Your spouse is not average. That man you married is not average. He's the hot stuff. That lady you married, she is the most beautiful woman on the planet. She is not average in all the men said. I got, I, man, I helped all you men out today. Just remember that. Yeah. Some of you needed it. Profess. What are you going to profess with your mouth? What are you going to declare with your heart? I think we always have to use the declaration, I I declare Jesus is Lord of my life. That's a starting point, and it's the continuing point of our lives. But there are other themes that we need to declare too. I'm a great person. I'm a great husband. I'm a great father. Start declaring what God says about you. I am the apple of his eye. I am the head, and I am not the tail. I am above, and I am not beneath. You hear this today? Your profession, the words that you speak. Scripture says the tongue can bring life or death. You may have heard negative words your whole life. Maybe like me, you grew up in a verbally abusive environment. Can I get a witness? beat you down, words said about you, to you, that you're like, you're still haunted by those. There's still words I remember that were spoken to me that I was five years old that sometimes come into my mind. Anybody else have that? You're like, seriously, we're just coming, I'm having a great day, having a great one church Sunday. And yet the negative thought can easily come into any one of us, but I refuse to speak those. I refuse to let them come out of my mouth. I'm going to just declare what God says about me, not what I think in my own mind. See, Job said it, remember? My own mind plays tricks on me. That's why we've got to go with what God's word says about us. Maybe you've experienced so much negativity that it's hard to see the goodness of God in your life, even in yourself. But I want to encourage you to do something today. I want to encourage you to change your profession. Change what you're declaring. Change what you are saying 
about yourself. Stop declaring what you were. Start believing who you are and what you will become. I can never, I will never, I could never, should never be spoken from the words of God's son or daughter. Scripture declares I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. What am I trying to say? There is power in your words. There is power in what you say. Power to unlock your destiny. Power to restore what the enemy has stolen. And power to redeem the wasted seasons of your life. Church, at least here to say, never say never. Can't do it. Don't let the words come out. But this is also equally important. Faith is best seen in action. There's a lot of people who have the right profession, the words they speak all seems right, but they don't act right. They want God's blessing, but they live in sin. They want abundance, but they don't tithe. Faith is best seen in action. It's got to be more than words. I mean, if anything we've learned over the last 18 months is words don't really matter. Think about it. Your words take you so far, but eventually it has to be what have you done? What will you do and what are you doing? We have to be more than words in the church. We can't just be words on Sunday. God, you're so good, amen, and we live like the devil Monday through Saturday. We can't, amen, pastor, preach to my wife. <laughs> See, never say never, people. They find a way to do the right things. They don't just say the right things. They do the right things. James said it this way, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you do not show it by your actions? The rhetorical question that's being asked, it is no good. There's got to be a point where our belief turns into behavior. Now, but behavior doesn't save us. Our belief in Jesus does. But once we believe in Jesus, the behavior has to begin to adjust. Things need to be adjusted because faith has to translate into action. Words say, God will heal my marriage. But at some point, you've got to stop being verbally abusive to each other. Simple. Words say, God, help me lose weight. But you can't expect God to help you lose weight when you're stuffing Twinkies down your mouth every night. You've got to get out there and do something. You've got to exercise. You've got to eat right. You've got to change your routine. Words say, I believe, God, you're going to give me a new job with greater income, but you have not sent out a resume. Words have to become actions. Belief has to become, you know, belief has to become behavior. Everything that you and I do, somewhere it's got to be about what we're doing, not just about what we're saying. Are you hearing this today? Never say never people put their faith into action. They don't just say they have faith. They prove their faith by their behavior. You cannot declare God's promises and just stop there. If you just simply declare God's promises and that's all you do, and you don't follow his process, I used to say this many years ago, if you want God's best, you got to follow God's principles. How many want God's best? Right, I do. That means i got to follow his principles. Where are his principles? It's in his timeless word that is unchangeable. So when people are trying to sell you on changing God's word, it doesn't change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. So we've got to build our life on that foundation. Somewhere you have to begin to act. Because faith is best seen in action. Never say never people will always try to act right. Sometimes that's determined by who we put around us. Your circle will determine your cycle. Who you put yourself around is going to determine. Now, let me say, how many of you love doing laundry? Let me see your hands. Seven of us love doing laundry. Now, this may shock some of you. I actually love doing laundry. I really do. It's perfect for an OCD person like me. 
I put the whites over here, the semi-darks here, the blacks here, and the mid-colors here. Get them all there, and then I make sure, well, the kids got their laundry, I got my laundry, and Mary's got her laundry. You just get the sort it, right? There's one problem, though. I don't like folding laundry. It's true, right, honey? So true. I will do laundry all day long. No problem. And there'll be six baskets of laundry waiting for somebody else to fold it. It's true. I love doing laundry. <laughs> but you know, I, last time I checked, you can't just take your laundry, throw it in the washing machine, work. <laughs> can't do that in the dryer. You can't, it'd be great, man, if I could, I dream a genie, twinkle my nose and it folds itself. Would be awesome. If anybody wants to come over and fold our laundry, we would gladly allow you. But see, I think sometimes we can be kind of like that laundry machine. You know, you have to choose the cycle you want to wash your clothes with, right? Bright, super bright, delicate, normal, permanent press, short, super clean, wrinkle-free, yeah, it's wrinkle-free. Once I put them in the laundry, I've got to then choose a cycle. When you put your life in the laundry machine of your friendship circles, you're choosing a cycle. Choose it wisely. Because that cycle runs and runs and runs. And for 56 minutes, that's how long it takes for us to do our cotton you will sit there and watch that thing spin. Let me say this. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are single and you are dating someone who is not a Christian, get out of that cycle. I know I'm on thin ice right now with some of you like, oh, Pastor, Pastor you step in. Well, you're right. That's my job. Step into it a little bit. You having sex before you're married? Change that cycle. Going to the club, Saturday night, you're so upset because we don't have 12.30 in Comac anymore because you're out late, you have time to get up. Change your cycle. If you're on negative people, you're going to become a negative cycle. If you're on bitter people, you're going to get stuck in a bitter cycle. You hearing this today? Your circle determines your cycle. And if you're simply going around with the same old, same old people and you're expecting different results, get some new friends. Oh. See, if you put yourself in an environment with the right people, you want to be positive, put yourself in a cycle with positive people. You want to be encouraging, get around encouraging people. That's why I love... I love my life, and not because I'm more blessed, not blessed, equally, whatever it is, but I love my life because I have a great circle. I'm so blessed to be married now 15 years to my Puerto Rican princess. She's been folding my laundry for 15 years. I'm so blessed by that. Why? Because I know when I'm down, she's going to pick me up. She's going to encourage me, and when I'm down, I hope I do the same thing. I try to pick her up. And encourage her. I love the cycle and the circle God has put in my life because of the people he's put in my life. I love our family. I love watching our family. I love my three kids. I mean, th there's no program. It's crazy cycle. <laughs> but I love that cycle. It adds joy to our hearts. You know, you want to you wanna turn your life around in a minute? Put yourself around children. I, I could be down. I'm with my three kids and one of them farts. I won't tell you which one of my daughters does it. <laughs> but there's something like that that just makes me smile because I'm like, I was so upset about this and just that one moment turn, turns that around. Then you have to go and run to the restroom and do all that stuff. But anyway, but I also love the cycle God's given us on our staff. I mean, we are blessed at Church Unleashed with the people that God is serving our church. I mean, it is a great <laughs> circle to be a part of. I mean, they serve tirelessly, they give generously, they love completely. I'm just glad. I know I could walk into a staff meeting, I could be down from a Sunday, and they're there to pick, no, but did you see this good part? Did you, did you experience that? And they bring me up, and I think it's probably reciprocated to each other. You know, it's a great thing. And then I come into church. 
And I walk in this environment, I'm like, man, this is insane. God, you let this knucklehead from Buffalo get to do this every week. And then I see and I watch people worshiping God. And they raise their hands and I can feel like, man, the finances weren't good this week. Or we didn't have the attendance we want. But then I look at people crying out to God for a fresh touch. i like, God, it is so worth it. I love the circle that I'm in. I love that we get to do life with you. So your circle often determines your cycle. Scripture declares this, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get into trouble. Some of you need to walk out of a relationship because, or a situation or a circle because you've been getting in trouble. You're doing things that are not honoring God. Your behavior's not right, and it's all because of your circle. Change it. Some of you might need to go and say, hey, you know, a friend of yours, hey, would you just read Proverbs 13, 20? And that's the reason I can't hang out with you anymore. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's a story in the Bible about five friends, four of which are healthy, one is paralyzed. They hear that Jesus is coming into town, and the four healthy friends say, hey, let's bring our friend to Jesus so that he can be healed. They get to where Jesus is, Jesus is preaching in a house, but it's so filled that they can't even get to where Jesus is. The crowd's too big. Most, most of us would have said this, hey, Mark, we tried. We got here, but there's no room in the house. There's no way you're going to be able to get to where Jesus is. We did our best, but the right circle makes all the difference. What do the four friends say? Hey, you know what? Let's get to the roof of the house. Let's dig a hole. Let's pull away the shingles, and then let's just drop them where Jesus is. <laughs> they didn't really drop them, but they took a rope, and they lowered them right in front of Jesus. Can I tell you? Those are the friends you need to have. Those who are going to bring you right to where Jesus is. You've got people trying to get you out of church, get them out of your life. You ought to have people that are trying to push you toward Jesus, motivate you toward Jesus, and bring you to where Jesus is. The crowds were so big, but yet these friends didn't say, we're tired, we've done our best. Scripture says this about this moment. They lower him down, and here's what Scripture says. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, mat and went home praising God. Catch this. If he had a different circle, he would have never been healed. If he had some of the people that attend church in America, they would have been like, oh man, it's too long a line. No parking, no that. Sorry, buddy. Good luck with that one. I'm glad he had the right circle because we could talk about his cycle today. We could talk about what God did in his life. His friends brought him to where Jesus was. He was miraculously healed. And what's the first thing he does? He gets up and praises God. I mean, that's what gets me up in the morning on Sundays. I can, hear, I can say, man, I wonder who's going to get saved today. I wonder what marriage is going to be restored today. I wonder who's going to be healed today. I wonder who, what person comes in discouraged and depleted is going to walk out encouraged and lift it up. Friend, that ought to encourage and motivate all of us. Why do I come to church? Because I want to see God show up and show off. I want to see God do great things. So you've got to be in not just the right circle to alter your cycle. Sometimes you've got to be in the right church to alter your cycle. Where God is speaking and moving. These friends of his were never say never friends. And those are the type of people we ought to surround ourselves with. Your circle determines your cycle. Surround yourself with the right people. And watch how God takes you to a new level. And then last, never forget, God always has the final say. Now, so many of us, we go through so much. You know, it breaks all of our hearts and staff when we go and we read the prayer requests that we get every week. People going through sickness or relational, financial. It breaks our hearts. We pray and we add every one of those to our prayer list. And we pray that God would turn the situation around. I'm the kind of person that will never give up on prayer. No matter how dark it may seem, no matter how bleak it is, I think we should always continue to pray for a miracle. Continue to pray for God to do something. The Bible talks quite a bit about how God has written every page of our life 
in his great book. God holds your future. And the good news, your future is filled with victory. It's filled with victory. What? Pastor, you you don't understand, Pastor. God can't turn this around. No, 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 I don't say never. I learned that from Timothy Lautenschlager. He never said that, never, you know, statement when he was playing football. And you know what? I will never say never to God. The moment we stop believing, we're saying never to God. God can't do it all. But I still believe God could do the impossible and the improbable. I've seen him do it. We continue to see him do it. And I want to continue to see him do it even greater ways. I want to see God do the great things. So your story is not you falling into pieces. That's not your story. Your story is not about you losing your home or going bankrupt or feeling ignored or living in fear. That is not your story. God has yet to write the next chapter of your life. God's plans for you are good. God's plans for you are for your benefit and for his glory. I love what the psalmist wrote. Oh, Lord, my God. You have performed many wonders for us. For your plans for us are too numerous to list. I want you to think really quick of a few of the blessings of God. Start thinking of them. What are you thankful to God for? Think about it right now. What are you thankful to God for? Can you keep going? Can you keep going? Can you keep going? Listen to what it says. The next line says, if I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. That means there's so much stuff that God has blessed us with that we're focusing on the wrong thing. He said, I've got so much stored up for you. You can't even write about it. You can't even talk about it. It is so good, the plans I have for you. But never lose sight of that. Keep your focus on what God is doing not what he hasn't done yet, because God always has the final say. What word do you need God to declare in your life? And speak what you seek today. Ask God. Ask God to move in a mighty way in your life. God has the last word in your finances. He has the last word in your marriage, in your job, in your education. People may have written you off, but God has yet to make his final statement in that situation you are experiencing. You may feel right now like you are being refined in the furnace of your life, but there is good news. You will come out better and stronger because of what you've been through. It is time for the church to declare, God has the final say. I'm not going to focus on my situation or my circumstances. I am going to focus on God. Matthew 24, 4 has a great passage for all of us. The news about him, meaning Jesus, spread throughout all Syria. Scripture goes on to say, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering from, with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics. What is those last three words? And he healed them. What are you suffering with today? What are you going through? What has so plagued your heart that you're having a hard time getting through it? Church, God wants to do in your situation right now what only he can do. He wants to heal, restore, bless, redeem, forgive, and he wants to celebrate you today. Never say never with God. God always has the final say. Always. There's a story about a, a house that caught fire. The young boy in the house had to go to the top of the second story house and get on the roof. The father was not able to get to his son, so had to exit the house. He's street level, the son is on the second story roof. He says to his son, says, son, jump, I'll catch you. The dad knew the only way for his son's life to be saved was for him to jump off the roof. But all the boy could see was the smoke, the flame, and the blackness engulfing him. As you can imagine, the son was afraid to jump off the roof. His father kept saying, jump, I will catch you. Jump, son, I will catch you. The son protested, daddy, I cannot see you. To which the father said, son, I can see you. 
Friend, there are times in your life when you will not be able to see the hand of God, when you will not be able to see him moving. But the father says to you, son, daughter, I see you. I see what you're going through. I see what you're experiencing. Just jump to me. So some of us today, some of us been standing on the rooftop of a burning house, and the father is saying, just jump. Today's your day to jump. And to trust that the loving arms of an almighty God are going to catch you when you jump. Today's your day. Some of you, this might be the first time you've jumped into the arms of your loving father. But this is going to be the greatest day of your life. Is anybody ready to jump? Would you close your eyes as we pray? With your eyes closed and your heads bowed, maybe, maybe today you're here and you've been standing on the roof of that burning house, maybe it's burning relationship, burning finance, whatever it is, you fill in the blank of your situation, your story, and you've been hesitant to jump. You're going through it and the pain is so intense. Challenges are so difficult. And you need this all-loving God to catch you. Can I tell you, if you jump, I can promise you I've been serving the Lord since I was 18 years old. There's not been a time that I've jumped that he has not caught me every single time. Say, Pastor Todd, would you pray for me today? I'm ready to jump into the Father's arm. I can't handle this situation anymore. I need God to show up in this situation. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. Stand to your feet right now. If you need to jump into the arms of the Father, go ahead, stand right now. There's something you're going through, a difficulty you're facing, where you need to just jump and trust God. I'm asking you to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet and believe that today as you launch yourself out, the loving arms of an almighty God are going to catch you as you jump. Today is your day to find that freedom that you've been longing for. You're in the right environment. You're in the right circle. Today is your moment. If that's you, would you just stretch your hands to heaven right now? Because you can't call on a person you can't call on yourself. You can't speak to your situation. The best thing you can do is speak to your God. You say, God, I pray, touch me right now. I'm jumping into your arms. Come on, just begin to talk to him right now, church, if that's you. Just begin to talk. God, I need you to intervene in this situation. God, would you show up in my marriage? Would you show up in this environment? Would you speak to me here? God, would you do something here? Only you can fill in the blank of your story. Come on, talk to him. Just give it to him right now. Say, Father, I'm jumping. I'm jumping. I know you're going to catch me. I'm jumping, Father. Amen. Now do something a little bolder. Begin to thank him in advance. Come on, begin to thank him. Come on. Begin to thank him. Begin to thank him for turning your situation around. Begin to thank him that God's going to restore. Begin to thank him. Because that, that atmosphere of expectation is the breeding ground for miracles. So expect today. The moment you stood to your feet, what you really did is jumped. In the arms of the Father, he's grabbing you right now. And he's saying, I'm not finished with you yet. Your pain may have been big, but my promises are even bigger. That difficulty that was meant to destroy you, I am going to use to direct you. Our holy, loving God is right now in this moment. He's catching you. You're free. The burning building cannot touch you anymore. You're in the arms of your loving Father. He senses freedom today. With the rest of us mind standing, and show our solidarity and support with those who are standing. And we're going to go in, and Curtis is going to lead us with his team in another song. But I just want to say this you know what? When you're going through it, and it seems to be so overwhelming, I've been there. I think everybody on our staff has been there. Every leader in our church has been there. Just about every person that wasn't standing would have had to stand maybe a year ago or six months ago or five years ago. The beauty of it is we're all in the same condition. We're all trying to get into the arms of the Father. Maybe you're here today, and you're a guest here today.
maybe you've been coming to church for a little bit and you have yet to surrender your life to Jesus. We had, I don't know, about a dozen people, Matt, in that first service give their lives to Jesus Christ. Say, how awesome is that? But I don't believe God's done yet. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God. The first jump you need to make is in the arms of your Savior, Jesus, to repent of your sins and say, I can't do it on my own. I need to surrender my life to a great, big, wonderful God. Maybe you're here today, you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Today's your day. Today is your day to experience His love like never, ever before. What does that mean to experience God's love? It means to, one, admit I can't do it on my own. Two, to believe that only God can provide me the help and hope I need. And three, that I'm going to declare that Jesus is the only source of my strength. He's going to direct my life. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could have eternal life. The whole service, your heart's been racing, your hands have been sweaty. You're thinking, man, I'm sensing something different in here. Something's happening in here. Today's your day to experience the love of the Father. With your eyes closed and heads bowed, say, Pastor, that's me. I don't have a relationship with Jesus today. But I'm that person that's, I know it right now. I want to get right with Jesus. If that's you, would you slip up your hand today? I want to pray for you today. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you for that hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, in the back. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, young man. Anybody else? Say, that's me. Just keep it up for a second. Raise it high so we can see it. I just want to pray for you. Yes, ma'am, in the center. Yes, young man, in the back. God bless you. Put those hands down. If you raise your hand, would you just say this prayer with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and be my Savior in Jesus' name. Come on, church, can we celebrate? Thank you. Come on, you can do better than that, church unleashed. I've been preaching 21 years and it still never gets old man we want to tell you that raise your hands we are so proud of you you are part of the family of God it is the best decision you could ever make on your way out go to the I bar we have a resource we wrote called before next Sunday grab it it'll explain to you what God's doing on the inside of your life can we finish celebrating today can we do that can we have Curtis and company lead us in a song tonight or today and celebrate and so here's what I want you to do we started our service saying we want to have an army of worship. Can we finish our service saying we're still going to be an army of worship? So would you raise your hands to heaven and can we sing with Curtis and the team and let's celebrate the goodness and the favor of God.